Well, good morning, church. We're going to teach you a new song this morning um, about praising God in all of the seasons. So why don't you stand so we can worship together?
changes everything Come when the fear is high You're finding the risen king Come on and let the light in Your love changes everything time. Good morning, church. Uh, there we go. We want to welcome you here in person and also those that are joining us live stream. I want to just remind us of one great eternal truth, that there's one thing that's unchanging, and that's God himself. He's the unchanging God. And what he did in the past, he can do in the present. And I was thinking about that woman who had gone to physicians for 12 years and was unable to have her situation changed. And she thought to herself, if I can just touch the hem of Christ's garment, I will be made whole. And that's exactly what happened. Now, that's not to negate 
you know, what physicians were doing in that time. And that's not to negate what physicians are doing in our time. But there are some things that only God can do. And maybe you're here today, you have a need in your life. It not, may not just be physical, it could be emotional, relational, financial, whatever the issue is. God is the unchanging God and he's able to do things that humanity cannot do. Amen? And so I want to invite our altar workers at this time, please come and we are going to pray with you. It could be for your need or a need of someone you love. Come and we will pray with you this morning and believe God to touch that need. Jesus took the cross, he took 
have to know that you're there with us at all times. You will never leave us or forsake us. We were created with a purpose. You have intent for each of us. So God, we just surrender ourselves to you this morning so you can use us for your purposes. God, we worship you. You are so good. Amen. Amen, church. Why don't you turn around and greet someone around you? It's so good to have you with us this morning. My name is Brady and welcome to Living Stones Church. Whether you are here with us in person or tuning into our live stream, we want to connect with you. So we invite you to fill out a connect card to send us your prayer requests. Well, hey there, everyone. My name is Brady and welcome to Living Stones Church. Whether you are here with us in person or tuning into our live stream, we want to connect with you. So we invite you to fill out a connect card to send us your prayer requests. Let us know if you're new or if you'd like more information about Living Stones Church. You can also fill them out online at livingstones.ab.ca connect. And if you'd like to give today, you can do so at the Information Center right after the service. For information on all of our giving options, including e-transfers, click the Give button on our website. We think our church is pretty awesome, but we want you to decide for yourself. Membership at Living Stones Church is optional. However, we want an opportunity to share our values with you, and this class does just that. Our next membership class is on Monday, September 19th at 7 p.m. Register at the Information Center, the church office, or online. 1 Corinthians is one of the most misunderstood and controversial books of the New Testament. The church world faces division over its teaching and application to everyday life. This course will explain how the gifts of the Spirit operate to build up the church rather than tear it down. Pastor Paul's class, A Study in 1 Corinthians Part 1, will be on Wednesday nights for eight weeks, starting Wednesday, September 21st. And this is a hybrid class, in person or on Zoom, with child care available for those joining us in person. Pre-register at the Information Center or online. Our Sunday Cafe is reopening on September 18th. If you are looking for a fast-paced, fun, and delicious area to serve in, the cafe is for you. We need several teams of volunteers on rotating shifts to help us reopen successfully. If this is an area you'd like to help out in, sign up in the foyer or online, or let us know by filling out a Connect card. Having a conversation about life, faith, and Jesus is hard. Alpha is about creating a welcoming, friendly place where people can come and ask questions to explore the Christian faith. If you enjoy meeting people and would like to get involved with this rewarding ministry, join us at our Alpha Team training on October 4th and 11th. Sign up at the Information Center, the church office, or online. And hey, thanks again for hanging out with us on this long weekend. If you have questions about anything you've heard today, or if you want to know more about LSC, stop by the Information Center or visit us online. If you're new here, we want you to feel right at home. So we invite you to stop by the guest reception kiosk after the service. We have a gift for you, and we'd love to meet you. With that being said, I'm going to dismiss middle school youth and pass it over to Pastor Paul. All right. Well, Brady's a little confused. It's not the long weekend. We've moved past that now. We're a week beyond that. But um, just want to make one little change on our announcements. We've moved my, the membership class from uh, this coming Monday to Monday, October the 3rd, because some people approached me and said, hey, we could make it if it was a little later. And uh, so if you're interested in that class, learning about what does it mean to be a member of our church family, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, join. It just means it's, it's an information class. So if you're interested in that, you may want to sign up. That'll help us make sure we have enough materials for you. We're going to go to the Lord in communion this morning. And I, I love this moment because for me, communion... Uh, is, you know, it's, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And I believe it's a renewal of covenant. I think that's so powerful. We have an amazing relationship with God. It's a covenant relationship. It's based on more than just emotion and feeling. I like that. And so we're reminded over and over again what Christ did for us. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, he said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And I just want to remind us that this little wafer, this little piece of bread, uh, represents uh, what Christ did on the cross. He died for our sins. He became a substitute for us. And I believe that there's a tremendous benefit when we receive Christ and we receive his kingdom into our lives. We entered this covenant relationship. There are so many blessings that most of us don't even realize it. They, they're just beyond our understanding. And so whatever your need is this morning, just cry out to him and say, Lord, I want to receive all of your blessings today. I want to receive all of the blessings that Calvary provided for me today. And we just want to thank him for doing that on our behalf. So, Father, thank you for this, uh, this day. Thank you that we're reminding ourselves of our relationship with you in this uh, bread which was broken for us as a recognition of your broken body for our sin and as a substitute for us, brings us amazing blessings from you. And we receive them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is an act of faith. We're making a declaration this morning. We're making a proclamation. Jesus died, he rose again, and he's coming back. And that's the exciting part. Let, let's just go back and remind ourselves, he's coming back. And you know, we have a broken world, if you haven't figured that out yet. And we, we battle with a lot of issues in our world. Sin has had an amazing impact on our society. We see it in the way we relate to each other. We see it in disease and death. You know, all of those things are going to come to an end. Jesus is going to come and rule and reign, and we're going to live with him in eternity. He's the perfect leader. Isn't that amazing? Lord, we thank you for this cup that represents your shed blood. And now, Lord, as we drink of this cup, Lord, we are making a proclamation to our world that you live, died, rose again, and are coming back again. And we thank you for that hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. So if you wouldn't mind just hanging on to these little cups, and when you leave today, just deposit them. We have a little garbage can on the way out. Just throw them in there. That would be appreciated. We have, are very fortunate to have uh, an amazing friend to our church. Actually, he's an outside elder, David McFarland. David, I try to have him come once a year. We've had the pandemic that's affected it a little bit. But, uh, you know, I've developed a beautiful relationship with David over the years. Uh, he's, he's really a gifted evangelist. God has used him in this way. But he's also been a pastor in our nation for many, many years. So he understands a lot about the life and dynamics of a church. And, you know, he's humbled me because he says, you know, I pray for you and Patty and for your church family every single day. Yeah, he says he does, and I believe that. That's humbling, and it just tells me he's an amazing man of God. He's an amazing outside elder. If we ever had a problem, we have men that love us and would step in and try to help us. And I think that's a gift from God. And so, David, we're so glad you're here this morning. Come and share God's word with us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Wonderful to be here. Pastor Paul is a good friend of mine, and I think you're a wonderful church, most of you. <laughs> There's a story of a lady who was on business trip, and she gets into a taxi, and she's busy going to the airport. She's on her phone, tells the taxi driver to go to the airport, and then she's on her phone quietly at the back for quite a while, and suddenly she notices he's going the wrong way. So she quietly leans over and taps him on the shoulder, and when she to tell him he's going the wrong way, when she taps him on the shoulder, he suddenly rears the car, and the taxi drives onto the sidewalk, and it runs over bushes, and it knocks down a newsstand, and finally it stops, and the man, and the lady said, what happened, what happened? And the taxi driver says, this is the very first day I've ever driven a taxi. For the last 35 years, I worked for a funeral home di driving the hearse. <laughs> 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 
And three years ago, we were like the girl and the lady in the back of the taxi. We were great. We were driving along. We had plans. We had goals. We had, and all of a sudden, COVID tapped us on the shoulder. We didn't expect it. And everything went way out. And it affected most every one of us in some way. So this morning, I think that it is time for us to, to laugh again. And uh, I laugh even more if this worked. Okay. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Did you? Okay. Very good. We're done. Great. Laugh again. I, I, I love to laugh. And my favorite music, honestly, in the whole world is, is children laughing. When children laugh or giggle, I, I just can't. It just touches my heart. It was a little girl and she was asked, you know, why are you a Christian? She said, because only God can give you ever laughing life. <laughs> and I thought that was so cute. And I love to laugh. I tell jokes all the time. I find that it helps me survive in life. Okay, I think it does. You know, if my dad used to say, if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving is not for you. <laughs> and the one I heard this week that I thought was very priceless was a young man who was tired of going to all the family weddings and all the old aunts and would point and say, in the wedding, she'd say to this young man, it's going to be your turn next, trying to get him married. It's going to be your turn next, your turn next. So finally he said, I had enough. At the next funeral, I did it to the old ladies. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> I love to laugh, so there you go. I love this quote. This quote says, laughter is a jam on the toast of life. It adds flavor keeps it from being too dry and makes it easier to swallow. So the question this morning is, am I a happy person? Or could I be happier than I am in spite of all the circumstances that are around me? Could I be happier than I am? In the book of Psalms, we need to remember it says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God has given us one more day to rejoice in it. In Nehemiah, he says this, this day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They're going through a tough time. They're grieving. And many of us during this last season have been hurt in many ways in relationships, physically, emotionally, and all, financially, and all sorts of things. It says, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We need strength at these times, and the strength includes, in a way we're going to study, joy as well. Joy for the tough times that we all go through in life. The Bible teaches something quite amazing, and it's radical for our culture where we are. And the teaching is that we are to be happy no matter what. And it's called joy in the Bible. Be joyful no matter what. And it's a skill that we need to learn, and we need to relearn, and maybe some of us need to learn it today. Spurgeon, the great preacher, said when he was teaching young people to preach, he said, when you preach about uh, heaven, make sure that your body language is positive and smile and nice. You're talking about heaven. And when you talk about hell, your everyday face will do. <laughs> so am I a happy person? It says in the Gospel of John, Jesus is speaking to his followers. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's speaking to you this morning. He says, I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So the question is, do I have Jesus' joy? And the second part of it is, or do I need a refill this morning? Is my joy complete? Now, if you're going to talk about joy or happiness, you have to go to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is a short little book, and it was considered the last book that the Apostle Paul wrote. And contrary to what we think when we read it, it actually was written in prison. Paul was writing this as a prisoner. In fact, he had been in prison for a couple of years. Then he'd gone to Rome on a ship. It was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a poisonous snake. And then he was two years more in prison, shackled between guards in a terrible, stinky prison. And yet, in the midst of this prison, Paul the Apostle in Philippians 4, near the end of his life, 
speaking to Christians, trying to encourage you. Last words I want to leave with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. It's contrary to human nature. It's contrary to the culture in which we live. But rejoice in the Lord always, even in the tough times. And I will say it again in case we didn't get it, to rejoice, rejoice. You see, the Bible teaches that joy is a choice. There were two old ladies driving along and, and really old folk and they were lovely old ladies that are driving along. Suddenly the passenger notices that Mildred drives right through a red light. She doesn't say anything but get to her next light and it's red and Mildred drives through the red light. She said, Mildred, Mildred, you drove through two red lights. And Mildred said, oh, was I the one driving? And so the question is, who is driving you, my life? And who is driving your life? Is it circumstances? Is it other people's opinions of you? Is it issues that you have or don't have? Who is driving your life? And Paul is saying here, rejoice the Lord. We need to draw, use our life. Now, I like to use this emoji. Maybe you do too. But often, in spite of that emoji, more likely this is what I should be posting. Going through pain, going through issues, loss, grief, Sickness, issues of all different kinds we face. I like Disney and I particularly like Winnie the Pooh. You see, this is an intellectual message. <laughs> and these are two characters that you might be familiar with. On the one hand, we have Eeyore. And Eeyore is never happy. Never. Everything is no, it's horrible, it's going to rain, it's terrible, it's not right. And he's very self-centered. Oh, thanks for noticing me. It's all about him. And on the other hand, we've got Piglet, the little Piglet. And Piglet is the exact opposite of Eeyore. Instead of being always unhappy, Piglet is always happy. And he's always helping others. He's seeing the positive in things. And he's caring and he's nice instead of being selfish. There's a bit of Eeyore in me. Is there a bit of Eeyore in you? We need to let the piglet out. <laughs> you never thought you'd hear that. That's a theological statement. <laughs> we need to be happy. It, life is a lot more fun when we choose to be happy. Now, here's the biggest challenge we have. The biggest challenge we have is this. When and then thinking. You know, I'm going to be happy when I get that promotion. I'm going to be happy when I find that young, dashing young man. I'm going to be happy when I make that sale. I'm going to be happy when I can live in the Bahamas. And we always put it off. And we aren't happy now because we put happy off to some other time. The Apostle Paul who wrote this from prison could have said, you know, well, I'll be happy when I'm out of prison and had a pity party. I have pity parties. Do you have pity parties? And we, oh, what's terrible happening to me? And, okay, but if only this, we've got to get over the then, uh, the when and then thinking. We need to look at joy now. In the book of Philippians, we read this in verse 11. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And the word learn means that it's not something that's natural. I've got to learn to do it. And I need to learn to do it better than I did. There was a university professor and he gave all his students, and there were hundreds of students in a lecture hall, hundreds, like 500 students. He gave them all red balloons and he had them blow them up. <laughs> they all blew up. Each one had a red balloon. He got them to tie it. Then he got them to write on the balloon their name. So the 500 wrote their name on the balloon. Then he said, now we're going to do an experiment. He took them out into the university corridor, big, wide, long corridor. And he's got them to throw the balloons and mix up all the balloons. And then he said, stop. And he got out a stopwatch and he said, I want all of you to go now and find your balloon in five minutes. Go. And the guys ran and the guyesses ran looking for their balloons, looking for their balloons. And you know, at the end of five minutes, not one single person found their balloon. Not one. So then he said, now I want to do it again. Now I want you to pick up any balloon and find the person who wrote their name. Find the person who the balloon belongs to. 
you've got five minutes, go. And they went out and started, and in five minutes, every single one of the 500 found the balloon. You see, when we look for, for happiness in ourselves, about me, you know, I want to be happy. This is all about me. And when we try to find happiness, we never find it. But when we try to bring happiness to someone else, everybody gets happy. Similar story, there was a dog, watched a little dog. The little dog was chasing its tail. And the dog, big dog said, why are you chasing your tail? Because I believe happiness is in my tail. I want to catch happiness. And he kept going round and round in circles. He never caught happiness. Finally, the little dog said, how do you do it? And the big dog said, I've learned that uh, when I don't try to find happiness, when I go around do what my master asks me to do, and when I'm his friend and when I help him, I find that happiness follows me wherever I go. You see, I have learned to be content whatever the situation is. Uh, I'm staying at a hotel, and thank you, Pastor Paul, for putting me up in a nice hotel. And on the wall, they have a thermostat. But there are two kinds of things, of course. On the one, we have the thermometer on, the, on, the, on that side. And the other is the thermostat. Many of us are just thermometers. Everybody's gloomy, I'm gloomy too. Everybody's grumpy, I'm grumpy too. You know, this isn't good, that isn't good. Easy to be grumpy. But the thermostat changes the temperature of the room. I want to be a, a thermostat and change the temperature in the room. But it is a choice. Look what it says here in, uh, in Psalm 537. Psalm 37 says, I, this is a psalmist, I will be glad. It's a choice. I will be glad and rejoice in your love for you saw my affliction and you knew the anguish of my soul. He say, he's not writing it in a birthday party where he just won a yacht. He's wrote, he writes this when he's afflicted, meaning pain and anguish, worry and concern and stressed out. And he says, I'm, I'm glad and rejoice in your love because God loves us. In fact, God could not love you more than he does right now. And God does not want you to be worried and anxious. God wants you to be at peace. And he loves you. And he's given you his presence in your life. So how do we apply that to our life? How do we leave here different than we came if we've got too much Eeyore, enough, not enough piglet? So I'm going to look at five steps that we can see in this wonderful little book of, of Philippians that I hope will help us. Number one, number one is reposition worry. Worry is a challenging thing. Worry, in the, coming from the German, means to strangle Strangle us. Strangle. And we all have go through pain of different kinds. And worry is learnt just like, just like uh, happiness is learnt. We learn to worry from other people. It says here in... Sorry, I'm, yeah, there we go. It says here in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, it's, it's not easy to do. I'm the first one to tell you it is not easy not to worry. It's not easy not to be anxious. But it says here, do not be anxious about anything. And the idea is it be pulled in many directions. Look what it says in the next verse, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see that? And the peace of God, which transcends understanding. There was a little boy, and, and uh, he was taken by his grandmother to a cathedral. They were, he's not a religious guy. And the little boy had never been to a cathedral, and he sees the beautiful stained glass windows and the sun shining through and, and all, all these different windows of the different saints. And he happens to go the next week to a Sunday school class at a Baptist church, and the teacher asks all the little kids in the Sunday school, what is a saint? And the little boy who remembers the cathedral puts his hand up and says, I know, he said, a saint is someone whom the light shines through. And I thought that was a wonderful description of what a Christian is. And then the little boy said, but it's no good if you're on the outside. And that's what this is saying. 
It says, and the peace of God which your son will guard your heart and mind, Christ Jesus. But in verse 7, it says this. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble here. Give me a second. Okay. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. That's right. Which transcends all understanding. You see, if you're outside and you don't know God, then this doesn't make any sense to you at all. You need to be on the inside. I was on the outside for 23 years of my life. Didn't want anything to do with God. And then one day I was invited to a church like this one. And, uh, and, and I'd had a number of encounters with Christians and I'd heard the gospel, but I haven't responded to it. And I was sitting there wondering if there was a God. My life was falling to pieces. I was considering suicide, even though in the natural, I was extremely successful doing well in business, doing well in all the things that I was doing. But I was just angry at the world broken, brought up in an alcoholic home and abuse and all those issues. And I, I was there in the church thinking, you know, this can't be right. And the guy preached on John, 20, John uh, chapter 14 where Jesus calms the storm. And uh, the disciples were in the boat and they were anxious and running around the storm. They were thinking we're going to sink. They were bailing as fast as they can. They were doing the best they could and they were sinking. They were not happy campers or happy sailors either. And not getting all, and finally they call on Jesus, and he gets up in the midst of the storm and says, Peace be still. And in that meeting, I prayed, sitting where you're praying, sitting now, and I prayed, God, I've tried on my own to get happiness, to get peace. I haven't found it. I'm going to call on you like they, the disciples did. And when I said, Jesus, I need you in my life, all of a sudden I understood or began to understand what it says here. It transcends all understanding and it guards your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you, you've never begun your relationship with God, you, you want this peace but you haven't got it, you're, you feel like you're on the outside, I'm going to pray with you before the, end, before the end of the message and right where you are, you can pray like I did. And my life changed at that moment and it began to change and has grown ever since. And you can pray that prayer with me. Look what it says in, in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. There was a pastor who was invited to go to the hospital, asked to go to the hospital, and the lady said, I, I, I'm in bed, but I'm getting better. Uh, I came to give you this bucket, a little plastic bucket. And she said, what is this? Well, that's a little coal bucket. This was quite a few years ago. I had somebody go to the toy store and buy me a, a toy bucket with little plastic pieces of coal. And, uh, and she said, why? I said, because I was sitting here in the, in the bed and I was anxious and I was health issues and I had financial issues and I had all sudden I was worried and I was getting worse and I was discouraged, I was depressed, I was despondent and suddenly I read this passage, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you and I decided that I needed to do something to help my mind to, to grasp this truth and so I got the little coal bucket and I got a little piece of coal and I said God and I, when I had a problem, an issue that I was worried about, I said God I give this to you and I threw the coal under the bed and now the bucket is empty and I finally understood that God does take care of us. Even in the tough times, he calms us in the worst of storms. A lady called Corrie Ten Boom, who was in a concentration camp, she helped not, uh, Jewish people escape during the Holocaust and she ended up in Belsen uh, uh, concentration camp. And this D Dutch woman who suffered all sorts of things. They traveled for 60 years around the world telling people that God loves you and that you can know him for yourself and God is able to forgive you and you can forgive others and God loves you. And he, she says this. It says, if you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. If you look at God, you will be at rest. God wants you to be at rest this morning. Yes, we go through trials and pain. Yes, we grieve. Yes, we've been betrayed. Yes, we've been hurt. But God heals. God gives hope. And God loves you with all his heart. So that takes us to the next point. And that is to pray about everything. There was a plaque in a church and the plaque said this. Why pray when you can worry? <laughs> Look what it says in verse, verse 6. 
But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, don't worry, pray. And if we prayed as much as we worry, we wouldn't be worried as much, would we? In James 4, it says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. You do not ask God. A pastor that I know and great respect, a mentor in the sense that he wrote books and I've enjoyed his books. He, t- he says that one day he was picked up by two guys and they were driving him to a prayer meeting he'd never been to. And uh, the two guys said, we, we were a couple of drunks, but God got hold of us and turned our life around. And at the prayer meeting, there was about 50 people and there was somebody on the piano uh, playing and they played incredibly and the people sang these hymns and choruses with all their might and then they prayed and they prayed with passion and there was worry in the group and pain and hurt and heartache. Uh, they were all people just like you and me, sometimes doing well, sometimes going, being, facing challenges. And they, they were praying. And one couple got up and, and said, you know, we hated each other. We were, we were going to divorce. We both cheated on each other. But God, but, but we, God got us together again and we've forgiven each other and we love each other because of God. And another beautiful young lady got up and the pastor saw this lady, beautiful girl and she said, I used to be a drug addict and one day I was found in the gutter and, and so the path went up and said, what made you change? And she said, Jesus. You see, Jesus takes broken people like me and broken people like you. And he gives us hope and he loves us. And, and so, you know, we, we need to pray about everything. God isn't up there not wanting to answer our prayers. So pray about everything. That takes us to the next point, And that is to develop an attitude of thanks living. There was a lady and she she was a wonderful Christian. She was very poor and she had a little shack of a house but she was very poor and the neighbor was an atheist who hated her and always criticizing her because she used to pray on the porch every day. Thank you Jesus for this day you have made and I'm going to be glad and he he would say humbug from the from the next house and God I thank you that you love me and you answer prayer. And he would say oh that's a lot of trash and And every day this lady would thank Jesus and and this guy would make fun of her. And one day he hears, the neighbor hears her pray, God, I don't have enough groceries to make it to the end of the week. Will you please provide for me, God? I, I, I really have a need. And the atheist heard that, so he decided to play a prank on her. He, he went to the store and bought all the groceries, and he put them on her porch. And so the next morning, she gets up, and she sees all the groceries. She says, thank you, Jesus, for providing the groceries. And the neighbor jumps out of the hedge and says, that wasn't God. I provided the, na- the groceries. To which she said, thank you, God, that you provided the groceries, and you got the devil to pay for it. <laughs> He, Paul says in verse 6, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You see, there is a connection between gratitude and happiness. There is a connection between ungratefulness and unhappiness and criticism and depression and discouragement. Attitude of thanksgiving is a key, is a key to happiness. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the next verse. It says this, sorry, the next point. So we've seen then that we need to pray about everything. And then we need to switch to a positive mode. Switch to a positive mode. Look what it says. It says in verse 8, It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, uh, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things and you will keep in perfect peace all who, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. Okay, such things. I passed it in Chilliwack, British Columbia. And it was a, a church of a lot of Mennonites were there. And they were from, many of them from the Ukraine where all the war is going on now. And in the crowd of this congregation was a dear old lady, one of many, and this dear sweetheart of a lady had seen her parents being killed in front of her eyes by the Russians 
in the war back, the first war, way back then. And she'd seen her dad being shot right in front of her. Can you imagine the trauma? And then she had to escape, and her, her mother was killed too. She had to escape by herself and with nothing, and she came to finally to Canada, and here she is, well into her 80s. And of all the people in my congregation, she was the happiest one I knew. She always smiled. She was always helpful to people. She was just like Eeyore. She was seeing the good. She was kind, helpful, always, and every time thankful for everything. And yet, look at the life she'd had. And you know what her favorite scripture was? The one I just read you before. And I'm going to read it again because I think it needs to be read in context. It says, it says this, reading from verse... Okay, let me try again. Reading from verse 8. Finally, brothers... This is her favorite verse. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, think about these things. I need to change my thinking. I need to focus on God, his love, his goodness, the blessings in my life, the positive side of life. You see, there was an optimist, and the optimist sees a glass half a glass that's half full. He sees it as half full. The optimist sees the glass as half full. The pessimist sees the glass as half empty. The opportunist, the opportunist drinks the glass of water. <laughs> but the Christian, the psalmist, says, "My cup runs over." He doesn't look at the glass. He looks at the source. And that's the answer, to look at the source. Look what it says in Isaiah. It says this, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So this morning, are your thoughts fixed on God? I hope so. And if we've been unfocused in some way, this morning I pray that God's love he loves you so much. He wants you to succeed. My granddaughter just ran in a, in a marathon of some kind in Washington. She lived in the state of Washington. And she came in third. And uh, you should see how proud my daughter was that out of all the hundreds of kids for the whole state of Washington in her, her group, she came in third. That's the way it is with God. God looks at you. He sees your potential. He loves you. In spite of all the things you've done, he still loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to succeed in life. He wants you to run well. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know his peace. He doesn't want you on the outside. He wants you on the inside so you can see the light shining through. My favorite story, and I have many, but this is probably my favorite. A pastor in New York City. And he's in his room, his office, after a sermon. He's preached a couple of times at a busy church, like this lovely church is here. And the usher says, we've got a guy here who looks like he's a little, a bit of a bum. He wants to see you. I don't want to let him in, do I? And the pastor said, yeah, let him in. And this young man, drunk, besheveled, you know, all beard growing, Red eyes, red nose like Rudolph and uh, clothes with spit on them and vomit and he comes in to the pastor's office and he leans because he's drunk. He leans on the, on the desk like this. And he said, did you mean, did you mean what you said? If ever, if ever, if ever. And the pastor remembered the scripture that morning, 2 Corinthians 5.17, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And the old drunk, yeah, that, that, that. It, did you mean it, that God could change me? And the pastor said, yes. But don't lie to me. Look, people have lied to me all my life. If this is another hokey lie, I don't want to hear it. But if it's real, sign me up. <laughs> and in that room, that drunk Pray to prayer. Now maybe you're here and you're not a drunk or maybe you're not even on drugs, but you're missing. <laughs> Your jokes are better than mine. <laughs> 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 
But in that room, that man prayed a prayer. The prayer like I prayed at 23, that changed my life. And the prayer was simply this. God, I've been running my own life and I'm not doing a good job. God, I need to know your love for myself. I'm tired of being on the outside. I want to be on the inside. God, I want to know you. I want to say, please come into my life. I messed up. I've committed sins. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. I repent. I want to change. I need your help to change because I've tried on my own and I haven't managed. God, come into my life and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And he prayed that prayer. And you can pray that prayer in a few minutes. It changed my life. And this drunk said thank you and staggered out of the office. About seven years later, this friend, this pastor from New York is speaking in Atlanta, Georgia at the Peachtree Plaza. When I was an executive with American Express, I used to stay at the Peachtree Plaza. Now I stay at Motel 6. <laughs> and, and he was there speaking at a conference. And suddenly he gets a phone call in his hotel room. And the guy says, I don't know if you remember me, but I met you in New York. I now live in Atlanta. And I am in the lobby of the hotel. Would you meet with me? And it was a drunk. I now live in Atlanta. So the... The pastor gets into the elevator and he comes down the elevator, Peachtree Plaza, looking for the drunk in the lobby. And there isn't a drunk in the lobby. There's a young man in a suit with a tie, a young woman in his arm and two little children. And as he walks across the lobby towards the pastor, he says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's why I preach the gospel. Because God has hope for every one of us. And if you're here this morning and you've never prayed to put like Christ in your life, I, I just want to tell you it changed my life and it will change yours. I'm going to invite you to pray in a few moments. And after the service, I'm going to stand at the front and I have some little folders that have websites on it where you can go for, for good teaching that will help you in, in the decision you made so you can grow in your faith. And they're free. I'm going to stand right here and you just need to come up to me and say, I prayed with you this morning. I'd like one of those. Don't come to get a free thing, but come because you prayed. Or maybe you wandered away from God and you're not where you want to be with God. But God loves you. And God brought you here this morning. It's not by accident that you're here. And God loves you. And he's giving you another chance. He's reaching out saying, you're my daughter, you're my son. I've got better things for you. And he wants you to leave here with peace and a happy heart. But we're going to close our eyes and bow our heads in prayer. Then I'm going to finish the sermon. Let us pray. Please, if you love the Lord, pray for the person next to you and in front of you and behind you. Pray for the people around you, please, that God will speak to them. Because this isn't human effort. This is God that is here. And Lord, the Holy Spirit is like walking up and down these aisles, just waiting for someone to respond. I remember when I responded and what a difference it made. May you respond this morning. I'm going to invite you to pray in your heart because God hears you. He knows all about you and he loves you. You pray along with me in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I have made mistakes. I have sinned. I want to change. I can't do it on my own. I surrender my life to you. Please, I repent of my past. I ask you to give me a new beginning. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. I want to be new this morning. Lord, I thank you for answering the prayer. I thank you that you have come into my life by faith. I thank you that I'm going to leave this church with you as my friend, with my hand in yours. And if you prayed that for the first time or if you're rededicating your life to Christ, remember that this prayer is your turning point, your turning point. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, do come and see me. I'll be at the front. And it'd be my honor, my absolute honor to give you one of these and maybe to pray with you again. So we see that we need to focus on, on the positive. So let's go to the last point. And the last point is this, okay, to learn contentment, learn contentment. In Philippians 4.15 it says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. Verse 12 says, I know what it is to be in need, I know what it is to have plenty, but I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. A guy called Viktor Frankl was a Jew in Austria, 
during the time that the Nazis took over Austria and they killed the Jewish people and they sent him, he was a, a neuro, neuro, neurologist, they sent him to a concentration camp. He had just been married nine months and his wife was taken as well, all Jews, and they were all annihilated and killed except him. And he was there for three years in a concentration camp, four different concentration camps, including Auschwitz. And when this, this man got out, he ended up going back to Vienna and was the head of a polytechnic institute on neurology. And he came up with this. During his years in the concentration camp, he saw people that gave up and died and just gave up on life. And he, he came up with this simple concept which had revolutionized the thinking of many people, was simply this, that the, the people can take everything for you except your last freedom, and your last freedom is your attitude in every situation. Nobody can take that from you. Nobody can take it. Look what it says in verse 13. For I can do everything, Paul is saying, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You see, we have Jesus. You see what focus, sorry, what Paul does now is all of a sudden he focuses on his mission. I'm going to read that verse again. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I want you to repeat it together. If you love Jesus, this applies to you. Ready? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. One more time. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You see, Paul could have thrown into prison. He could have given up on his purpose, his situation changed, his life changed, like COVID changed many of our lives and livelihood and everything. We, we, you know, we could focus on what we've lost and, and the horrible things that happened, but Paul could have done the same thing. You know, I used to be able to preach anywhere freely and I used to be able to start all these churches and I can't do any of that anymore. Poor me, poor me, poor me. But instead he focused on his mission. Yes, he couldn't preach everywhere like he could, but he could write and he ended up focusing that his mission wasn't over because he could now write and he wrote all the books in the Bible that are there were written by Paul and he ministered to millions and billions of people around the world for 2,000 years. We need to refocus our lives. Refocus like Paul the Apostle did. And it says this, so I choose to be happy. And it says this, my final scripture as the worship team come back. It says this, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It said, to God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And my closing story is simply this. Simply this. There was a man who went to see a pastor that I know, and the man was despondent, discouraged. He lived in New York City and he hated New York City. I hate living where I live. I hate the commute to work. I hate going to work. I'm tired of my family. I'm tired of the pressures I've got. I just always depressed. I'm always discouraged. I'm always despondent. And the pastor said to him, this guy was a Christian. He said, I want you to do an experiment with me. Would you do this? And the guy said, yes. I want you to think when you go home, that tomorrow is the last day of your life. Tomorrow you're going to die sometime during the day. So when you get up in the morning and have breakfast, I want you to realize and think, this is the last breakfast I'm ever going to eat. When you say goodbye to your wife, I want you to recognize that that might be the last time you talk to her. You know, we need to leave, live each day as, as if it were a last, because one of these days we're going to be right. And you've got to think of that commute as the last one and, and your work, the last one. And he said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'm going to live as though I'm going to die at any moment. So he goes home and uh, to his amazement, when he gets home, he, he tells his wife what he's going to do. And in the morning, the bacon and eggs taste much better. It's the last meal he's going to have. And when he walks to the station, instead of being worried about his work, he looks at the houses and the trees and the birds. And on his commute that he hates, he, he notices the lights and the people and says hi to them. And the same with at work. And when he comes back in the evening, his wife of 35 years greets him. And he, he loves her and hugs her and says to her, his wife, you know, from this day on, we're going to have the best life we've ever had. You see, that's what Jesus wants you to do this morning. He wants to see you enjoy the life you've been given. 
I hope that my message has in some way inspired you to leave here with a smile in your face and a, a smile in every way. And I'm speaking at the next service and I'm speaking tonight. And if you know someone who you think this message would help, please phone them or email or text them and tell them to come out. And you can even come back and hear it again. The jokes would be the same though. <laughs> Not any funnier. I want to thank you so much for being such a kind audience to me. And I will be at the back to give this to those of you who prayed with me. God bless you and thank you so much. Bye. Amen. Let's stand. Amen. Thank you so much, David, you, for being Jesus. here. I really was touched this morning. I trust you were as well. Amen. You know, as I was thinking about what he was sharing with us here, the thought that came to my mind, it's been, it's been in my mind now for about a week or two. You know, Paul writes, he says, make the most of every opportunity. So many of us, we're not living, we're just moving through life. Seize what God is bringing to you and rejoice in it and be grateful for it. Live life, redeeming the time, he says, making the most of every opportunity. Let's not squander the precious gift of life that God's given to us. Amen. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you've spoken powerfully into our lives. And now as we leave this place, Lord, let us seize the day. Let us make the most of every opportunity in the way you are going to guide our steps, even this day and then the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you leave this morning. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We've loved having you. Once again, we do want to get in touch with you. We want to hear from you. So go ahead, follow that link to our church website and click the Get Connected button and we'll get in contact with you. And you can give from that same place. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Be blessed.